Father, we thank you this morning. Jehovah, we are grateful for another day that you've given us to come into your presence, O oh God, to worship you, to lift, your, to lift our voices and our hands before you, O oh God. We thank you for being with us through the week. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for the many things that you have done in our lives, O oh God. We are grateful. And here we are this morning to bless your holy name, to dance for you, to, to clap our hands and to raise our voices before you as a way of giving thanks to you. We thank you. Be with us from the beginning of the service until the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. And that's his nature. Wow. Gote aliko alie karibu na wewe. Yes. Give them a high yeah, a high feast. And welcome them to our service this morning. If you are watching us from home, we want you to stand and you want, to, and you want us to dance together as we say we have seen what God has done to us. The fact that we are alive this morning is a sign that God has done it and we are grateful this morning. Amen. And those of us who are here with us this morning want to request you to stand up and we will dance with you together. Amen. Oh, to me, oh, now. To me, oh, now. 
And we want to lift our hands this morning and say, every day and every hour, you are faithful. You are faithful even in those times when you are broke. We have sung that when we were down, you lifted us up. And Jehovah, we are lifting our hands, saying every day and every hour, you are faithful. You have done so much. We love you and we honor you this morning.
Nishwe Ju. Let's sing together. Zaidi ya. together Lord Jesus we want to give thanks to you this morning because you've given us an opportunity once again to worship you we thank you Lord because in our worship we've given you a praise through singing worshiping you and saying I'm pressing on on the upward way we pray God that you lift us on higher ground even in this season God that we are faced with this pandemic we thank you for what you are doing to us as a church and even as a nation and we want to praise you God because we've seen your hand we want to pray that you continue blessing us and helping us so that you'll be able to stand firm in your word and overcome the challenges that comes on our way we thank you because of this opportunity that you've given to us God as a church to reach your people through this uh, program that we've had in our services through the Facebook, YouTube, and through the radio. And we give you praise, thanking you, Lord, because there are many people today who are appreciating what you've given unto us. We pray, God, that even as we continue worshiping you, the rest of service, that you'll speak to our hearts. We thank you for our nation. We want to commit all our leaders before you. We pray for our president, and together with those who are serving with him, we want to pray for your wisdom upon them. We want to pray for understanding in our country. We want to pray that, Lord, you will cool the political temperatures that we see rising in our country so that you will enjoy the peace that comes from you. And right now, God, we want to thank you even as a church in this month. We appreciate you for our families. We pray, God, that even as our someone comes, God, talking about uh, what we need to do in our families, I pray, God, that you will help us so that we will have strong families. We thank you for everything that we ask you, God, to continue watching over us and blessing us even as we go on in this service. I give you praise and all the honor. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Buenas uh, sefiwe. This morning we are so thankful to God for giving us an opportunity to come and to worship his name. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to our service. And even as we go on worshiping God, we want to worship him through our giving. And I request you that you prepare so that you can give God your offering or a tithe that you prepared for God today. And our baby number is 830-550. 830-550. So I request you, you give as our choir will be leading us in one song. Please give generously and the Lord is going to bless you in all whatever you are doing. Kisha alisikwa, 
and everlasting God we come before you Lord with thanksgiving in our hearts we appreciate Lord for providing for us something that we can be able to give back to you oh God Lord we come back with thanksgiving in our hearts oh Father we say thank you because of the provisions you've provided for us you are Jehovah Jireh in our lives oh God remember those who don't have oh my Father that you may provide for them that they too may have something to bring another time Lord we bless you we honor you we worship you receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Bwana asifiwe. Praise God. This month is our family month and we will be talking about matters concerning our family. Today especially we are talking about when marriage becomes a battlefield. When marriage becomes a battlefield. One of the things that a lot of people don't know is that we do staff appraisal as pastors at the beginning of every year. Attached to this staff appraisal is our salary increment or not. And what we do is we sit down and you take stock of what you did the past year, what you said you would do, what you have done, what you have failed to do, and we sit down with the staff and finance committee and you're given a chance to explain why you haven't done what you're supposed to do, what you're willing to do differently this year. We then proceed to set goals for the coming year. Um, and if there was something in the last year that you did not achieve, you have a chance to achieve it in the coming year. Now, sometimes our pay will be based on that appraisal. And if you get bad marks in the appraisal, it means something will not look so good on your salary. And because of that, we work day and night to try and meet what we promised we would do. Because we are given the opportunity at the beginning, uh, in October, to set our goals for the next year. You promise you will do A, you'll do B, you'll do C. And the finance and staff committee will ask us, what do you need to do this? And we will say, we need this amount of money, we need this education, we need this training, we need this. And they say, if we facilitate, will you be able to achieve these things that, we, that you promised? And we say, yes. And at the end of the one year, then, you have no reason really not to have achieved what you didn't do. Um, I just thought, you know, in marriage, it is possible to do stock take. It's possible to do marriage relationship review. Because when we stand at that pulpit, we give promises. We say, I will do this, I will do that, I will stop this, I will stop that. And we give promises to the person that we are saying yes to. After a while, some of those things are not achieved. But because there's no review, there's no way to find out the things that you promised and how well you're doing, Sometimes you find along the way we have forgotten what we promised and we have neglected what we said we would do. And so I think about it this way. With staff appraisal attached is salary, an implication on your salary. And I think what you get from your marriage is far much more valuable than money. Which is why for me I think a marriage review is necessary every once in a while. To be able to sit down with your spouse and to say, this is what we promised. How far have we come? This was our plan 10 years ago. Why have we not achieved A, B, C? The thing with conflict in marriage is like it's sandpaper that is slowly scratching the surface and causing, you know, after a while, if you have been ukigwara the same place, you know, if you have been working at the same place, after a while, the smoothness becomes a dent. And before you know it, you create a hole because you're hitting the same place. And it's the same thing with unresolved conflict in marriage. After a while, it tends to become a sourness, a pain that stays and begins to eat away at the relationship, begins to eat away at what you thought was a good thing. It is indeed sad that the one place that people are dying every day is marriage. Sometimes physical death, sometimes emotional death, sometimes spiritual death. I have heard it said sometimes that this girl used to do this. She used to be a Sunday school teacher. She used to do until she got married. This man used to do ABC until he got married. True, sometimes maybe it's your work that got busier. It's the children that you got and you got busier. Sometimes the untold truth is that the struggles that you found ahead have chipped away not just at your relationship, but at your spiritual life as well. And when you want to stand in church and, and, and be part of the women's committee, you think to yourself, with my issues, me neither quickly. And you say, let the people who are happier, let the people who are, let them just do it. I, I can't. And it begins to eat away 
at the things that are valuable in your life. There are many that are married and live lonely and separate lives. Society has taught us to mask pain and show no one where it really hurts. The internet is abuzz with photos of beautiful couples and sadly, sometimes the same couples, their pillows are awash with lonely tears shed in solitude. I had this girl that wrote her story online. I don't know how true or how not true. I, I don't know her personally. But she had this story of having endured violence. And she said, these are the pictures I allowed the public to see. And she posted the pictures. And they were, they were such a beautiful couple. And then after writing the story, she wrote down there and said, these are the pictures I did not post on Facebook. And she posted them. And she had swollen eyes. She had, you know, her lips were cracked from violence. And the truth is, that's not so far from what we're seeing nowadays. In fact, there's so much pressure to be picture perfect. There's so much pressure to prove to your friends, to prove to the world that you're doing so well, we will do anything to get a perfect shot. And sometimes we will hug in the picture long enough for the click, for the button to go, and then draw the line and go back to our war zones. During premarital counseling, we ask, what is it that you like about this man? Why are you deciding to marry him? Or oh, you should listen to the answers. He's kind, he's, he's so generous, he's sweet, he does this, he does that. And then we turn to the lady and we say, so what do you like about, you know, we turn to the man and we say, what do you like about this lady? Why do you want to marry her? She's caring, you know, she's all these things, and it is so flowery. A few years down the line when we sit down in marital counseling and we say, what's the problem? And sometimes because some of us participated in your wedding, we try and tell you, you know, remember the things that you found pleasant in each other. And we ask, what are some of the things you like about him? And you should see the reaction. People say, um, um, I don't know. He, he comes home on time. You know, and we ask the question the other way, and you can see people scratching their heads, like literally looking for why. You know, and sometimes the joy turns into pain. And we wonder, what do you fight about? Because when, in fact, sometimes when we're doing premarital counseling and we do conflict resolution as a topic, the couple is literally seated wondering when you'll finish because then they don't see themselves arguing. And, and, you know, they're waiting for you to just be done with this topic. Can we talk about something happier now? Um, a few months down the line, they discover what they are, you're talking about. And a lot of times they come back to say, what were you saying about that thing? What is it we fight about? There is a huge, huge list. I will not go through the whole list. But one of the major things that I have seen couples, I'll say some of the major ones. Money. Money, 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 money. Somebody sang and said, Pesa ni sabuni ya roho. But I have come to learn that in plenty or in lack of it, it can become a bone of contention. Naturally, we are different personalities when we do meet each other. And I am the spender, my husband is the saver. And I remember us trying to budget together. And it was so hard because I would budget and then for some reason, it was so hard to stick to the budget because I would say I need 2,000 shillings for the supermarket, for salt, for what. And then in the middle of the supermarket, I see Roiko and I remember, oh, si and then we walk down the aisle, I'm like, what, si rice? That, that's my personality. My husband, on the other hand, will write down what he's spending on, how much came in, how much, if you ask my husband how much he had in a month, he'll tell you. If you ask him, he'll write down exactly, down to the shilling, what he did with it. If you ask me, and this is the plain truth, Sometimes I don't even know how much came in in a month and exactly where it went. And if you're like me, sometimes you leave the house with a thousand shillings and then you come back in the evening and you begin, Lilienda market. No, but that was 50 bob. And then, and then at the end of it all, you have no answer. You say, it's okay. Money can become an issue if not handled properly. The very children that God gave to us that are supposed to be a gift from God can become a bone of contention. How to raise these children, how much time we spend with these children, who bears what role when it comes to these children. Because children are very cute when you take pictures, 
But sometimes people don't know the responsibility that goes into the raising of children every day. The number of hours you have to wake up in a night to take them to the toilet, to give them water, to give them milk. Uh, somebody said there's no, th there's no child as thirsty as the one who you want to, to, to take to bed. Um, sometimes when I'm taking my daughters to bed, that's a the time they remember they want water, then they remember they want milk right after we've gone to bed, then they remember I don't know they want what. And sometimes there's a lot of work that goes into raising a child. Um, more often than not, one spouse will feel like they have been left to the responsibility of raising the child. Uh, it comes to school, who takes a child to school, who picks a child from school. It comes to school fees, who pays what, who stays with what. And sometimes we conflict over how, when, who, when it comes to the children, how to raise the children, the cost of raising the children, the method of raising the children. You were raised in a home where you are slapped for anything, including answering with your eyes. And you know what I mean? What I mean? Um, you know? And then you come from a home, maybe your husband or your wife comes from a home where children were you negotiate with them, you talk with them, and before long you find yourselves uh, at war at how to raise these children. Personalities, um, and, and somebody said opposite at, opposites attract while dating. In marriage, opposites attack. Because while dating, your personalities seem to complement each other. What he lacks, you have. What you lack, he has. He's not so talkative, you're talkative. Uh, she's a spender, you're a saver. And, and you know, when you're dating, it's a match made in heaven. You know, God knew exactly. In fact, we say, uh, you know, God must have known the things that I did not have that he created her just for me. After marriage, you look at the seven and you say, Woy, woy, woy mkono birika. Kitambu atoe tu ten bob." Umeimba, umeomba, ume convince, ume threaten. And you look at the spender and you start saying, my husband, he wastes money. He can't account for anything. We can't plan anything. We can't plan for our future. Personalities. You say she's talkative, she's bubbly, she's the life of the party. And a lot of times a talkative person will get attracted to the quiet person and you say she's so talkative, she's so bubbly. After marriage you say See, any, I have no space to even say a word. Akotu. And you say oh he's so quiet, cool, calm and collected. After marriage you say boy my goodness this guy is boring. The things that attract you begin to become the things that you're fighting over the things that you thought were complementary become the things that you fight about. In laws, our loving, amazing in laws, in laws or in loves can swiftly, quickly become a source of conflict in a marriage. And we asked one young man, we told him, you know, don't live too near to, to your in laws in Akwanga. And I know some of you watching and listening might not agree with me, but the distance helps a lot. <laughs> and, and we asked one young man, we said, he was going to build a house right next to his mother. We said, you don't want to build a little father? And he said, you know, I remember, I still remember his words. He said, Pastor, my mother is the best mother. Now I want to ask you a question. Whose mother is not the best mother? My mother is the best mother. And my husband's mother is probably the best mother as well. You know, everyone's mother is good. Everyone's sister is good. Everyone's brother is good. But the truth is, after a while, comparisons begin to be made. Um, you know, like I said, we have different personalities, not just with our spouses. We have different personalities with our in-loves. Um, you know, I come from Bomet, where we monitor, we are... We, we monitor small things, eh? We, we have the time. And, and, you know, you get people coming and saying, oh, she hasn't woken up on time, you know. Kwani, my son, alioa, mtu anamka saande. And normally, Reverend Joy says, kama alioa wakua amka saande, na alichagua na alitosheka na iyo. Iyo ni yake. Kama alioa mwenye ajui kupika chapati, na chapati inatoka ugali, ya itoki nyororo, kama yako. Iyo ni yake. <laughs> You know, and our in-laws 
can become a source of contention. When you come from a family where you're in each other's business, you tell each other everything. When you're buying land, your clan knows. It's not just your brother, your sister. All of you know, yani, umetangaza kwa jamii, unanunua shamba. And your spouse who comes from a family where they're private has to stand phone calls or being told, so, ni mesikia mnanunua shamba? <laughs> you know, sometimes he has to wonder, yani, there's nothing private. We can't talk something between the two of us. And for you who's on the other side, you wonder, why are we not telling your side also? Because we grew up in different families. Communication can become another issue of contention. Communication, how we communicate, how we hear what we hear. Uh, somebody said there's what, is, what you have said and then there is what is hard. And sometimes I hear people in marriage saying, that's not what I said. In fact, when you go to the office and you sit down for counseling, and the other one says their side of a story and you say, okay, you say your side. And he begins by saying, let me just say, pastor, that's not what I said. But there's what is hard, there's what is perceived through your words. And sometimes how we communicate, how we talk, modes of communication, frequency of communication can become an issue. My husband is a communicator. I am not. Um, and if you have texted me or called me, you can attest to this. I can see a text today and then remember on Friday that I was supposed to re respond. And I think to myself, whoa, 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 I've not responded. I'll respond very quickly on Friday. My husband, on the other hand, prefers to chat through the day. Like he'll find out how my day was. And sometimes an issue of contention for us has been that I don't communicate back. And, and you know, communication can become an issue when you don't communicate in the same format, in the same way, in the same frequency, or how you speak, um, you know. I always said, and I, I give examples of Bomet because that's where I grew up. Bomet people, by the way, I love you with all my heart, uh, where there are two ways of saying you need salt in your food. The normal way is please help me with some salt. In Bomet, we prefer to say, mumeamu atukumbi chumbi, atukuli chumbi kwa chakula. You know, and sometimes the other person is thinking, I won't get too. You know, when you want to ask whether dinner is ready, you don't say chakula meva, you say mumeamua tukuli, mumeamua tukai njaa kwa nyumba leo. Um, if you come from another culture and you marry somebody from my region, utashanga, siange uliza tuka chakula imekua. Uh, but in my region, we understand each other. So when you're told mumeamua tukai njaa kwa nyumba, you come out as a woman and say, eh, baba, inakuja tu saai. Infidelity and faithfulness. And this perhaps is the most painful and the most hurtful source of conflict where your spouse is unfaithful uh, with somebody else. And this becomes a cause of a lot of conflict and pain in marriage. The truth is sometimes infidelity is a fruit. Sometimes there's, there's conflict that has been brewing, which is why I want to briefly mention the effects of conflict, unresolved conflict. Sometimes because you want peace, it is easier to sweep things under the rug. It's easier to keep quiet instead of responding. It's easier to say, ah, what's your turn now? The more we leave conflict and we don't resolve it, the more it brews and the more it gives birth. And one of the fruits of unresolved conflict is infidelity. Um, one of the things that I say about conflict, unresolved conflict, is that hurting people, and I read this in uh, one of the books we were doing, Mizizi, by Simon Bevy, hurting people, oh, sorry, Muravi, hurting people hurt other people. And because your heart, your own emotions are not intact, there's something going on with you. The truth is you're not thinking straight. And you will hurt the people around you. You will hurt your wife. You will hurt your children. You will hurt your relatives. Because you yourself, you're hurting and you're in pain. And sometimes your cause of pain to other people is just a response, is just a reaction of what's going on in your own heart. And sometimes it affects the self-esteem of the people around us. It affects the quality of the marriage around us. It can cause depression. It can cause anxiety, fear, decreased productivity, where you have people that are at work, but they're really not working because their minds are divided. You have health issues. You have insomnia. You have divorce because people are not dealing with conflict. I want us to read a scripture because since I began, we have not read a scripture, and that is intentional. We will read the word of God. What do you do? What do you do when your marriage becomes a battlefield? 
Because while some of us have picture perfect poses, while some of us have amazing photographs on Facebook, on WhatsApp status, the truth is some of us cry each night in bed. The truth is some of us have ulcers because of that marriage. The truth is some of us have insomnia because of that marriage. The truth is there are men and women undergoing depression because of conflict. The first thing I would say is pray about it. There is nothing that is impossible with God. Pray about it. Pray about it. The hymn that we sing, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Because we do not take it to Jesus. I had a problem with my car and I tried to sort it out with several people. Eventually somebody told me, why don't you take it to Toyota? Because my car is a Toyota. Why don't you take it to Toyota? Toyota will understand best what is wrong with your car. And sometimes the best place to take that grievance, that pain, is to the feet of Jesus. Because he best knows what the solution is. The second thing I would say is, I would say is compromise. It is, right, it is better to be happy than to be right. And sometimes marriage is a union of two people that are completely different, completely different backgrounds, completely different families, hoping to join their differences and make something that is one. And to join forces and become one sometimes may mean I have to give up some of the things that I think they should be done this way if it can bring happiness to my home. Compromise. Know what to fight over. The truth is some things are not worth fighting over. Pick your fights. There are things that you can say, hey, Kai, know your tendencies. And this for me is the biggest revelation. Know your weaknesses. Know your needs. Self-awareness. Know yourself. Some of us come from, with baggage from our own homes and we load it over our own spouses. And that's a topic on its own. That sometimes you come from a place where there was a lot of unfaithfulness in your family. And you bring it to your marriage to the point where your husband cannot put down his phone before you check the design and check the messages. Before you check his receipts just to check where he's been, who he's been with. Because you experience pain in your own family and you're carrying it forward. Self-awareness to know these are my pains, these are my hearts, these are my tendencies, these are my needs, these are my weaknesses. Once you know all this about yourself, then you make it a point to learn the same thing about your spouse. Because when you know your spouse's weaknesses, you can't be able to make up for it, to compromise, or to help them through it. Once you know their needs, you can meet their needs. Once you are aware of who they are, where they come from, they came from a background where this was rampant in their family, then you know where to help. Begin by knowing yourself. Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, as I wind up. Ephesians 4, 25 to 32. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. The distance between anger and sin is very short. It is very easy to sin when you're angry. When you're angry, it is such a ripe time for unfaithfulness. It is such a ripe time for violence. It is such a ripe time. In fact, the Bible tells Cain, Cain um, when you read the story of Cain and Abel, um, Cain is told that sin is at your doorstep, it is seeking to devour you. It is seeking to come in. Sin is at your doorstep, Cain, because Cain was angry and jealous. And what anger does is it draws in the opportunity for sin. In your anger, do not sin. I always say you have a choice. Even the wrong choice is a choice. Because sometimes we make mistakes and we say we didn't know or we didn't have a choice. The truth is, even the wrong choice 
is a choice. Don't let the sun go down, the Bible tells us. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let it brew, in other words. <laughs> and women are very good at brewing issues. Una kalisha, inaiva, unaongeza roiko, inaiva, inaendelea kuchacha. By the time you come to the table and you're talking, your husband wonders, ni chumbi, ni litisha. You know, he'll say, pass the salt. But because it has been brewing, na umongeza salt, umongeza roiko, umongeza kachumbari, kadania hapo, akiuliza chumbi. The explosion that follows, your husband wonders, ni, 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 ni chumbi ya mani. What did, what, what did I do? Because it has been brewing, imekua ikiiva. The Bible tells us, do not let the sun go, go down. Because the truth is, when you let the sun go down, and you know this as well as I know, when you let the sun goes da- go down, it gathers, you gather moss. The snow, when it's rolling down, it starts as a snowball. It keeps gathering as it goes. In fact, the more you sit and you're not talking to him, you remember even, even last year, hmm? on 5th of April, he did. Hmm. And then even, hmm, this man does not respect me. He did not start yesterday. In fact, last week, hmm? by the time he's talking to you tomorrow, you're beyond talking because you may gather evidence for war. Don't let the sun go down. Don't give the devil a foothold. I said conflict is ripe ground for the devil to work, to plant doubt, to plant fear, to plant sin. The more you're in conflict, the more you're angry, the more you're upset, the more you're brewing, the more the devil just gets. And all the devil needs sometimes, by the way, is a foothold. He doesn't need your whole heart. Just one stain. One stain. Don't give the devil a foothold. Be kind and compassionate. You know, sometimes when you're in conflict, you forget you're on the same team. You want what your spouse wants. You want this marriage to work. But sometimes we fight like it's a football team trying to beat the other. In fact, sometimes when you hear fights between couples, it's who will win this fight. It's not what will we get out of this fight. It's not what can build our relationship from this fight. It's who will walk out victorious. Be kind and compassionate because you're on the same team, because you want the best for your mate. And really, if you're looking out for me and I'm looking out for you and we're looking out for each other, chances are we will build a healthy marriage. Forgive as Christ forgive. Forgive as Christ forgive. Forgive. Verse 32, forgive one another just as Christ forgive you. Marriage gives a lot, a lot of room for forgiveness. And I always say, be generous with forgiveness. You never know when you will need it. Never lose hope because there's always healing. If you're willing, the same way we work at what we failed in our appraisal last year to make it work. If we can do it in our careers, we can do it in our homes. There's no home that is beyond redemption when you take it to the feet of Jesus. And I always say when you fight, don't say or do things that you cannot take back. Don't say or do things that you cannot take back. But I will say, take it back to the author. When you find yourself in conflict, take it back to the author. Because he's the one who wrote that story. He knows how to rewrite it. He knows what to fix, how to fix what is broken. Because really, we want the same thing. We want homes that are working. We want marriages that are working. Who wouldn't want that? We want our pictures on Facebook to be true. That when we smile, it's true. It's not just for the picture. It's true. We want our homes to work. And in Jesus' name, they can work. Reverend Joyce told me a secret a long time ago. That you, having legally been married in that home, and I stress the word legally married in that home, have the authority, even in heaven, to command and ask certain things, and God will move because you have legal authority in that place. So take it back to the feet of Jesus and tell Jesus this is what needs fixing because there's nothing impossible with our God. There's nothing impossible with our God. Let's pray together. Father God, we have been hurt. We have hurt other people. We have spoken words. We have done things. We have been unfaithful. We have drunk away our time. Lord, you know. You know how we, are. we have dealt with the pain. 
We have broken our marriages. We have broken our vows. We have broken our homes. And first and foremost, God, we repent. We repent for unfaithfulness in our hearts. We repent for our physical unfaithfulness. God, we repent of thoughts and deeds that have been unfaithful. God, would you forgive us? True repentance is that we would not just say sorry, but that we would stop doing what it is that we're doing that hurts the other person. Would you help us to stop the habits, the thoughts, the texts, the phone calls that we know will hurt our spouses? Help us to find healing. God, we want to pray for our children. That, Lord, if they have sat through arguments, if they've had to watch fights, would you cover them, Lord, that they would not grow up to hurt other people because they're hurt. Help us to heal our marriages. Help us to heal our children, Jehovah. Help us to heal our relationships. Help us to heal our homes. Where we have given the devil foothold and we have invited anger and we have invited deceit, we have invited lies, we have invited sin. God, we repent today. And we shed off everything that is not of you. And we ask Jehovah, would you remove anything that is attached to our marriage that is not of you? Jehovah, we ask in the name of Jesus, would you remove anyone? Because God, you have given us legal authority over our marriages. Would you remove anyone in the name of Jesus that is attached to our spouses, that is attached to our marriages? Jehovah, would you remove anything that is stumbling our marriages. Jehovah, would you heal our relationships for your glory and for your fame? Lord, for those of us that have pain and we don't know where to go from there, for those of us that are healing from different sorts of pain, would they find healing in you? Would your hand be able to heal every bruise? Would your hand be able to wipe every tear? And Lord, would you who, from whom the idea of marriage comes, would you heal our homes? Would our homes be a source of salvation, not just for us, but even for our neighbors, for our children, for our house helps, for the people around us. God, would you help us? Would you heal us? Would you bless our homes? Jehovah, today we call our homes blessed. Jehovah, today we call our homes happy. Jehovah, today we call your love into our homes. Fill our homes with love. Provide for us that we will not lack Jehovah. And I pray, bring back the joy of that first love, the falling in love that we first experienced, the genuineness, the friendship. Bring it back, God, because there's nothing that is impossible with you. We thank and we bless you in the name of God the Father, of God the Son, and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Shortly, we have our Sunday school on YouTube right away. Uh, please join us for our Sunday school. Thank you. We'll see you next week.